So this video is sponsored by Squarespace. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. Hey everybody, so about two months ago I reviewed the Meiju 16S and that phone proved to be very popular, at least according to my YouTube comments. A lot of people liked the phone because it was a great value. You got a Snapdragon 855 for 350 bucks, but also because the phone had a very symmetrical design. It made you didn't achieve the symmetrical design by using pop-up cameras or a second screen on the back, none of those gimmicks. Instead, it made you just simply made the top and bottom bezel very, very thin and kept them symmetrical. And who knew that's really all you needed to have a good looking device like this. Well, this here I have on me, it's not the Meiju 16S. In fact, this is Meiju's newest update. This is the Meiju 16XS. So as you can see, it keeps virtually the same design as the Meiju 16S, but it's even cheaper at $245. So here's why the Meiju 16XS is $100 cheaper than the Meiju 16S. So the first thing is this phone runs on a Snapdragon 670 instead of the Snapdragon 855 family in the previous Meiju device. The second thing is this phone has a plastic back, so it doesn't feel as premium as the glass back seen in the Meiju 16S, but it still looks pretty nice and it still fits in the hand pretty nicely. And third, the haptic engine on this is nowhere near as good as the haptic engine seen in the Meiju 16S. Now that's not necessarily a bad thing, that's just because the Meiju 16S's haptic engine is that good. If you used a Meiju phone before and you use other smartphones, you'll know that Meiju's haptic engine, at least in its flagship phones, are on par with Apple's and LG's, meaning they're the best of the best. So of all these shortcomings, I think the only area that most people will care about is the chipset. Snapdragon 670, it's more than a year old. It's definitely inferior to the Snapdragon 855 and also inferior to the Snapdragon 730 that's seen in the Xiaomi Mi 9T. And I have found that, you know, for the most part, the phone is not slow per se, but sometimes there's a little bit of stutter here and there. Like when I try to swipe up sometimes, the, the action doesn't register as fast. Now to be fair, maybe it's because I've been using a OnePlus 7 Pro and that phone just zips around, but this phone just feels like a beat slower. Like everything, it's not, it's not super laggy, but it's just sometimes it feels a little bit slow to me. And you know, I didn't have this issue with the Meiju 16S, which runs on the Snapdragon 855. So I'm inclined to believe that it's a combination of the chipset and also the fact that this one only has six gigs of RAM, but it's just a little bit slow. Now, ironically, the Meiju 16XS may have a more capable camera than the Meiju 16S. So as you can see here, this is Meiju's first triple camera setup ever. So the main sensor, it's a 48 megapixel lens, which we've seen in a in like 12 other budget phones now. And then accompanying the 48 megapixel sensor, it's a five megapixel depth sensor and an eight megapixel F 2.2 wide angle camera. So this marks the first time Meiju is using a wide angle camera in its phones. And I think for a first time attempt, it's pretty good. So Meiju's software, the camera app, will automatically in real time fix the barrel distortion. And in fact, it's a little bit slow, so you can see it in action. As soon as you switch to the wide angle camera, you'll see the corners of the frame kind of get fixed a little bit, like with this little warping action. It's a little bit weird to see the image warp like that, but the fact that the camera app is fixing distortion in real time, it's good. Now, previous Meiju phones, you get a telephoto lens that offers three times loss of zoom. So you don't get that here. Instead, you get that depth sensor. So yeah, you don't get to shoot lossless zoom photos, but to be honest, if you ask me, and I think a lot, a lot of other people, we'd rather have the wide angle than a telephoto lens anyway. And the depth sensor here actually does the job. As you can see here, it actually can detect the object in real time, whether it's in the foreground or background. And you can switch back and forth too, and you can see the depth of field blur in real time, and I like that. It's a real depth sensor, not like the ones you see in like the Doogie phones. Now looking at the rest of the hardware, not much has changed. You still have a, headphone jack at the bottom of the phone along with a, is it focusing? Yup. You still have a headphone jack at the bottom of the phone along with a USB-C and a single bottom fine speaker grill. So the left side of the phone is mostly clean other than a SIM tray. This SIM tray houses two SIMs, but no SD card. So that means when you buy the phone, you have to make sure there's enough storage. So on the right side of the device, you have a power button right here. It's pretty clicky and volume 
rockers. You see there's a little bit of a camera bump here, but not too bad. But the phone does wobble when you put it flat on the desk. Now on the top, you have a mic, and that's it. It's pretty clean. And um, even the edges of the screen, it's still relatively smooth, which is something Meiji does well, because on some of the other budget phones, like a Xiaomi device, or even OnePlus before the 7 Pro, like if you hold a OnePlus 6 or OnePlus 5, the edges right here are a little bit rough. So I'm happy to report that Meiji did a pretty good job of kind of chamfering the edges here to make it blend more seamlessly into the device. So again, this is a plastic back, so it doesn't feel as premium, but other than that, pretty nice looking phone and 6.2 inches after using phones with 6.4 and 6.6 .6 inches 6.2 just feels really small so now i can i feel like i can use this phone with one hand easily and it fits into the hand very nicely and of course major software lets me bring down the notification shade by swiping anywhere and that really just improves one hand usability Okay, so let's talk about the wide-angle camera again since that's um probably like the only new thing with this phone so in general in daylight with good lighting you're gonna get a pretty good shot but if you pixel peep that's when the flaws pop up because this is an 8 megapixel wide angle camera so there's just not a lot of megapixels to play with not a lot of pixels so if you look at this picture on a phone screen or on instagram it looks great but if you transfer this to the computer and you blow it up then you see that details are, are very very soft in the middle and then the edges you get a little bit of just kind of mushiness it's very soft details and that's only during the day when you have good lighting at night the wide angle camera it's pretty bad i would say almost unusable so this is a nighttime wide angle shot you see it's completely noisy it's completely blurry now but in contrast if you swipe here now this is a normal photo it's a lot sharper right it's a lot sharper a lot cleaner but when you go to the wide angle it's it just loses so much details so yeah the wide angle camera it's pretty bad at night but if you're shooting during the day and you're not trying to blow up the picture to put it on a frame on a wall it'll be fine i mean the fact that this one's 250 bucks and you get a wide angle camera i think is huge and i'm not really going to complain because it still allows you to get a lot of really good shots when when you're traveling during the day like in europe with a lot of beautiful architectures or in hong kong with tall buildings you want to get the whole frame then the wide angle camera will be able to get that so as i mentioned the depth sensor is legit so you get some really good bokeh images right here you get a really creamy bokeh effect that looks pretty good and again like i said you can see the effect in real time so that, that allows you to kind of check the framing now the main 48 megapixel sensor is pretty much the same story with all other budget chinese phones i've tested meaning during the day it's great you're gonna capture some really sharp really clean images i think color temperature tends to be a little bit warm coming from this camera but for the most part these images are great at night it's when you start seeing like visible noise visible grain and a loss of details but the good news is that Meiji is introducing a night mode with this phone for the first time too so it's kind of buried under settings so you have to jump into the camera app and then you have to swipe to the right go to more and then it's at the bottom it's called super night mode so from here then at this point you just have to take a picture and it'll take like a second to a second and a half and then after that it'll stitch together multiple images and you'll get really makes a big difference it's a lot better lit than the one without let me find a sample here so you see right here it's a night shot taken in auto this is a pretty nice shot but although to be fair it's not that dark there's a lot of uh, ambient lighting and city lights but now if you move over here to the night mode or super night shot and you see dynamic range is a little bit better and colors pop a little bit more right so this is a photo that if you put on instagram it will look pretty nice so again the main camera struggles at night if you shoot in auto but if you go to auto night you'll be fine in fact you can get some pretty serviceable night shots if you shoot with night mode so i'll show you some samples right now now in terms of video you can shoot video at 720p, 1080p, or 4K resolution, but only at 30 frames per second. And in general, videos are lively and sharp and vibrant, but except there is no stabilization whatsoever. So you see I'm walking right now and it's, it's very jerky. But colors are good and you can zoom using that two times zoom toggle button 
in mid video and on top of that good news you can shoot videos of the wide angle camera too that's huge that's something that you can't even do on a oneplus 7 pro right now on oppo reno now as for the selfie camera uh i'm not a big fan of selfies but i think for the most part it's fine it's um it struggles a lot with dynamic range so you see with this bright lights coming in it, it will it will blow out parts with really bright lights but again it's a 250 dollar phone and i'm not gonna have too much complaints it's it's definitely not like the best selfie cam out there you see right here the background behind my girlfriend it's completely blown out but you can get some pretty decent images if you have good lighting condition but even here you see my face it's a little bit overexposed from the window because the light is shining in too bright okay so before i continue with the review i want to talk a little bit about my sponsor squarespace so don't skip this part please watch it support my sponsors so you, some of you guys may know that before i became a youtuber i i was a more traditional journalist meaning i wrote for newspapers and i was a copy editor all that but um, about a year and a half ago, I decided to transition to becoming like a multimedia tech content producer. So that's when I started the YouTube channel. And recently I started a website because it's important to have a website nowadays if you want to build your brand. So squarespace.com is really good for that. So if you're someone who wants to build your own website, but you don't know how to code yourself or and you don't have the money right now to hire a web designer, squarespace.com is really worth checking out because you just have to go on there tell them what website you're making like you literally answer one question and after that you'll get dozens and dozens of professional templates to choose from and then you pick one and then from there you can make real-time changes to the template you can change the font you can change the background image you can change the accent color you can basically build your own website on the spot like visually you can see the changes yourself you don't need to know html you don't need to know how to code you do everything on the front end and that's really a simplified version of making websites and i was just on there for 20 minutes and i built something that looks pretty serviceable and i personally don't know anything about building websites so whether you're a tech reviewer like me or like a entrepreneur with a small business or just something you know you want to build a brand for yourself right now I highly recommend you go to squarespace.com just check it out and build something for yourself you get a free trial right off the bat so you can you know see how you like it and if you're really liking it and you want to start your own website my viewers right now can get 10 percent off there's a discount code so you just go to squarespace.com slash ben's gadget review without the s uh, at the end of review so it's squarespace.com slash ben's gadget review or use the coupon code Ben's gadget review and you'll get 10% off your first website so back to the phone review now so the major 16 XS runs on Android 9 with um, Android skin that's called flyme 7.3.1.0g it's a very heavy Android skin as you can see there is no app tray which is a little bit annoying but I do like some a lot of things Meiju does with the software so for example, I already mentioned this, you can bring down notification shape by swiping it from anywhere. You can also run your finger along the edges of the screen to cycle through all your apps. So then you just have to bring your finger to the middle to open it up. So overall, the app aesthetic, they look pretty clean. And you also have stuff like double tap to turn on the screen. But you can't double tap to turn on for some reason, you can double tap to turn off. And you have an always on display that actually shows you third party notifications. Oh, and Meiju also gives you three different versions of navigations, which is useful. I like having options. So right now I'm using the full screen swipe navigation, which works just like the Huawei and Xiaomi implementations. And just like the one that's coming to Android 9, you swipe from the edges to go back. You swipe from the bottom to go home, swipe up and hold to go into app overview. But if you don't like that, you can also go into traditional Android buttons with three buttons set up and also MBAC. MBAC is like Meiju's own uh, navigation bar that uses a combination of swipes and taps. I'm not a big fan of it. It kind of reminds me of the Android 9 pill. I'd rather just use traditional Android buttons or full screen swiping navigation. You see, there was a little bit of a lag right there. You see what I mean? So the Snapdragon 670 for some reason just isn't that optimized on this phone like again it's not like super slow but every now and then i'll see a little hiccup like that and just sometimes um like i'll try to g 
get out of something and it'll just be like a slight hiccup like a beat slower than the Meiji 16s and other phones but again that's nitpicking here because ultimately this phone is 245 US dollars. Oh yeah, and battery life. Do I really need to talk about it? There's a 4,000 milliamp hour battery in there and just like every other Chinese phone on earth, battery life is excellent. It can definitely last you all day. In fact, I used this phone all day yesterday, heavily. And then when I went home, I still had like 30% battery life left. So this is a phone that you won't need to worry about. And if you need to charge, you can charge via USB-C. So that's another win because some of these other budget phones charges via uh, micro USB and uh, let's do a quick video speaker test. So as I mentioned, there's only a single bottom fine speaker And uh, you can easily muffle it So it's a uh, 70% let's go up to 100% So yeah, the speakers overall, it's serviceable. I do think at max volume, there's a little bit of distortion, but you know what we gotta do? We gotta test it with music. So we'll go up to 50%. We'll go to max. Yeah, so at max volume, th there's really no bass and uh, quite distorted. So that's about it for the Meiju 16 XS. So this phone so sells for 245 US dollars for the base model. That's six gigs of RAM with 64 gigs of internal storage. If you wanna bump it up to 128 gigs of internal storage, that will run you another $30. So that's like 270, 280. And for this price, I think this is a really, really good phone. I personally would still prefer the Meiju 16 S because for hundred dollars more, you get the Snapdragon 855. But with this phone, you get a wide-angle camera, and that's something you don't get from the Meiju 16S. So, so you know, each phone has pros and cons, and of course, there's also stuff like the Realme X, which is a really good deal, and the Xiaomi Mi 9T. So, as usual, right now, if you're a fan of smartphones, or if you're on the market for smartphones, it's a good time right now, man, because all these Chinese brands are competing, and we, the consumers, win. We're getting really damn good value nowadays. So that's it for now. Thanks for watching.